Welcome to this video. The fifth video in my series of videos on Cantor's 1895 and 1897 articles on the theory of aggregates and transfinite numbers. Section 5 is titled The Finite Cardinal Numbers. This section starts on page 97, but there's only a few lines at the bottom of page 97 which relate to section 5, none of which require any explanation. Page 98 is where we're given the definitions of finite cardinal numbers. Notice that Cantor is no more specific about what this E sub naught is other than describing it as a single thing. Evidently the nature of E naught is irrelevant. Any object which is considered as a unity could be E naught. Notice the notation here. An aggregate of a single element is denoted as E naught in parentheses and not E naught in braces, as mentioned in the video to section 1. The notation E naught in braces suggests the aggregate of E naughts, that is, the aggregate of all objects which have been identified as E naughts, which, of course, would be inappropriate here since E naught is presumably intended to be a single object. There isn't very much to elaborate on with Cantor's definitions of finite cardinal numbers. The definitions are fairly self-explanatory. They work in an inductive kind of way, that is, 1 is defined and then nu is defined from nu minus 1 for each nu greater than 1. So I'm not going to enter into any discussion at this stage of the validity of these definitions or whether there are more suitable definitions. We'll take Cantor's definitions as they are. The only finite cardinal number that is not the sum of the immediately preceding cardinal number and 1 is 1 itself. It seems clear from this that 0 is not included amongst the finite cardinal numbers. That's not necessarily to suggest that there isn't or couldn't be a cardinal number 0, but that such a cardinal number is not counted amongst the finite cardinal numbers. Cantor's comment that every cardinal number except 1 is the sum of the immediately preceding 1 and 1 applies only to the finite cardinal numbers defined in this section. As we will see, there are of course cardinal numbers which are not finite, and these are certainly not the sum of the preceding cardinal number and 1. We're then presented with a series of theorems A to E. Regarding theorem A, we're told that we have an unlimited series of cardinal numbers, 1, 2, 3, nu, and so on. It's very important to note that since this is a series, then it's ordered. But the ordering is, as far as we know at present, a very general type of order which simply indicates which numbers are earlier in the series than other numbers and which numbers are later in the series than other numbers. Of course, the series of cardinals presented is a very familiar series and we may be tempted to jump the gun a little bit and say that if a number is earlier in the series than another number, then the former must be less than the latter. We're not in a position to say this at this stage. We have to wait for theorem B of this section to be proved and which shows that we can use the less than and greater than relations in the expected way on the series of cardinal numbers. The theorems A to E are not proved in the order in which they're stated. Theorems D and E are proved first and then theorems A, B and C are proved using the results from theorems D and E. Then towards the end of the section, another couple of theorems are stated and proved. The statements of the theorems are clear enough and present no real difficulties. Theorem D, which is the first theorem to be proved in this section, is proved in two parts, A and B, since there are two possible cases to consider. Part A refers back to the comments on correspondences in section 1, on page 87. Part B of the proof of theorem D uses transitivity of parts, since we know that M1 is a part of N, and since N is equal to the union aggregate of M1 and the object F, and N is the whole of M, or is a part of M by assumption, and so M1 is a part of M. The rest of the details of the proof of theorem D, both parts A and B, require no further explanations. For theorem E, that E sub nu is equal to the aggregate whose members are E0, E1, up to E nu, is from the definition 5 on page 98. Also notice that the theorem does not simply say that the cardinal number of the N1 in the statement of the theorem is less than nu, since we haven't yet shown that the numbers 1, 2, 3, up to nu minus 1 are indeed less than nu, and that the cardinal number of E nu is nu plus 1 follows from point 4 on page 98 and point 6 on page 99. For part A, we've assumed the validity of the theorem up to nu, and since the cardinal number of E sub nu minus 1 is nu by point 4 of page 98, then the theorem is valid for the aggregate E nu minus 1 and any part thereof. The proof of theorem E doesn't present any real difficulties and requires no further explanations. The proof of theorem A requires a bit of care. The first part of the proof is based on an induction argument. That is the statement, every one of the aggregates which we have denoted by E sub nu 
has the property of not being equivalent to any of its parts is proved by an induction argument. This part of the proof is relatively straightforward, but then we come to the part which says, consider two numbers, mu and nu, of the series of finite cardinal numbers. Then if mu is earlier and nu the later, e mu minus 1 is a part of e nu minus 1. As mentioned earlier in the video, it's important not to confuse earlier with less than. We have to be very careful how we think of things at this stage. The proof of theorem A is very careful to say that mu is earlier than nu, and not that mu is less than nu. The series of finite cardinal numbers is determined by the order of construction of the e nu's. That e mu minus 1 is a part of e nu minus 1, therefore clearly follows from how the e nu's are constructed in 4, 5 and 6 of pages 98 and 99. Since it's already been shown earlier in the proof of theorem A that all of the e nu have the property of not being equivalent to any of their parts, then it follows that e mu minus 1 and e nu minus 1 are not equivalent. Since they're not equivalent, then, by section 1, they cannot have the same cardinal number, and so, the cardinal numbers in the series, 1, 2, 3, and so on, are all different from one another. Again, in the proof of theorem B, we see the phrases earlier and later, but clearly in this proof, we're actually aiming to show that, for the series of finite cardinal numbers that we've already derived, that earlier and later are actually synonymous with less than and greater than, respectively. The proof is reasonably self-explanatory. The proof of theorem C is also straightforward enough to not require any further explanation. Theorem F is very significant in that it shows that any aggregate of finite cardinal numbers, which includes the possibility that the aggregate may be the aggregate of all finite cardinal numbers, under the less than relation is a well-ordered aggregate. This theorem is of fundamental importance in the theory of aggregates. The notion of well-ordered aggregate is properly introduced and defined in section 12. Cantor uses the term segment in relation to the proof of theorem F. Segment is not defined until section 13 in relation to well-ordered aggregates, and from what I can see, the way that segment is being used in the proof of theorem F is in the same sense as the meaning and use of segment from section 13 onwards. I imagine the proof of theorem G going along the line of using theorem F to find the smallest cardinal number kappa 1 in the aggregate K. That's equal to the union aggregates of the objects kappa 1 and K1, and then apply theorem F to K1 to give K1 equals the union aggregate of the object kappa 2 and K2, where kappa 2 is the least cardinal number in K1, and kappa 1 is less than kappa 2, and hence K is equal to the union aggregate of kappa 1, kappa 2, and K2, and so on. Of course, K may not be a finite aggregate, but we may continue to apply theorem F infinitely many times to obtain the result of theorem G. Applying theorem F an infinite number of times needn't be considered suspect, since in the first place we may have to inspect an infinite number of elements of the aggregate K in order to identify the smallest element kappa 1. Thank you for watching. If you found this video useful, then please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. You can see more videos on various topics on my channel, and if you have any suggestions for topics for future videos, then please feel free to let me know, and I'll try my best to put something together. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and keep an eye out for new videos being uploaded to my channel.